Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our virtual lecture series surrounding our exhibition, Andrew Forge, The Limits of Sight. Uh, if you missed exhibition curator Karen Wilkins' opening lecture or the gallery talk by Fairfield University Associate Professor of Studio Art, Suzanne Shamlin, you can find those videos on our website, on our Watch, Listen, and Learn page, or you can go directly to the website for this exhibition, which is fairfield.edu slash museum slash Andrew Forge. Our speaker this evening is going to help us conquer all of our anxieties about looking at Andrew Forge and the work of other abstract artists. Danielle Ogden has over 15 years of academic and museum experience. She has an MA from Boston University in Art History and an Ed M in Education from Harvard University. She's currently an adjunct professor at Fairfield University teaching modern art and the history, theory, and practice of museums. And she also serves as museum specialist in adult learning at the Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Art. Prior to this, Danielle held uh, positions in education and adult programming at prestigious museums worldwide, including the National Gallery Singapore, the Museum of Modern Art, the Harvard University Art Museums, the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, the British National Trust, and the Westport Museum of Contemporary Art. So please join me in welcoming Danielle Ogden. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. So what I would like to do is, even though we're virtual, I'd like to start the way I typically begin all my classes. And I would like to ask you to get comfortable, to center yourself, take a few deep breaths in. You can close your eyes if you want to. And just take a moment to center yourself. So much of this conversation today is going to surround itself around this idea of surrendering to an artwork, but we can't do that if we're not fully present. So I'm asking you to set the intention to engage with the content tonight. A few housekeeping notes. The talk will be about 30, under 40 minutes, and I've strategically not incorporated any captions throughout the presentation, but there'll be a reference sheet at the end. So if you'd like to screenshot that, you're welcome to. All right, and we'll get started. So based on the title of this talk, How to Look at an Abstract Painting, you might anticipate that I'm going to define the movement and share some artists and place abstraction within a historical context in the context of what we call modernity. And it would certainly be easier to talk you through a standard model of talking about abstract art scholarship, how it finds its origins in the 20s and 30s, mostly associated with Kandinsky, and then go into the 40s and talk you through Jackson Pollock and Motherwell and de Kooning and Frankenthaler and Joan Mitchell and Rothko and then I could discuss the post-war historical events, uh, how artists came from Europe and they brought about, brought with them new ideas and techniques, how they rejected traditions and the past and academic salon style of painting and advocated for impulse and personal expression. This would be very typical of our traditional chronological approach to looking at art history cause and effect, one ism after another. But we know that the world is not a line, it's more like a web. So this talk is going to focus instead on asking questions. We're going to challenge our conventions of looking at art, particularly abstract art. And what I would aim to do is shift our approach for how we read it consider it and in what ways it is relevant to us. And this task can be a tough one when it comes to how we receive a work of art. So much about abstract art has to do with the sense of freedom, uh, emotion, and the feeling of individuality of the artist, but how do we access these feelings for ourselves? And one of the most challenging components of all of this is that it is an, an entirely different form of language. So when someone sees an abstract painting for the first time, it's easy to get confused and even frustrated by it. And we can meet it with a certain degree of skepticism. 
And it's often considered the most challenging because it doesn't look like anything we know, or rather it doesn't convey an accurate representation of what we are accustomed to see. And on top of that, it seems so often that the artists don't give us much of anything. Here I'm showing you an example of Agnes Martin, who was often associated with this notion of painting while turning her back onto the world. And yet she wanted to envelop viewers with her own personal vision. Well, then how can abstract art be meaningful to us when it's so challenging to come up with its meaning? And when we are so used to seeing and reading images based on what the subject is, when it's not identifiable, when it's broken down into form and form alone, where do we go from there? So our agenda today is we are going to discuss why abstract art is so hard to read. Then I hope that this will lay the groundwork for talking about Andrew Forge's exhibition, The Limits of Sight. And then we're gonna to touch upon this idea of abstract arts relevance. And what I would like to do is frame the talk around a series of questions. What is perception to begin with? Perception is so rooted in this idea of process and understanding process will be a key component in having us, will lead us to a deeper understanding of how to read an abstract work. Can art communicate feeling purely through material and form? Meaning just because an abstract work does not have recognizable content, does it still carry content? So just without subject matter, does it still have content? And then what does abstract art allow the artist to do? Can abstract, abstract art bring a visual language to a non-visual subject? And I would argue that just because we are removing the subject matter doesn't mean we are removing its meaning. It's still meaningful. We just have to get at it through a different way, a different approach. And then is abstract art relevant at all? Abstract art is so much about its own inwardness, its own vocabulary. So especially in terms of today's climate and in terms of larger social political questions, does abstraction turn away from the world? Is it a retreat from it? Or can we look at it as being engaged with the world? And with all of these questions, I hope they will provide a platform for how we might thoughtfully encounter a work of art in a way that feels meaningful to us. And what I would also like to do is channel some of Andrew Forge's style. Forge is known for not only being an art historian and an art critic, but he was also an inspirational teacher. And his students often talk about how he was able to see the big picture and the minutia of a painting and also tap in and really hone into not only a work of art, but also his students' needs. So I hope to challenge some of that style in, in this presentation. Okay, so why abstract art can be so difficult to read has so much to do with our present ways of looking. And while thinking about this question, we are reminded of some of the reasons why people need mediation when looking at a work of modern art and especially an abstract work of art in the first place. And I'll take here some of the theories that are introduced by Danielle Rice, who's the director at the Delaware Museum of Fine Arts. She's also a museum educator. And one of the things she talks about is that we know that one of the reasons why we feel so challenged by works of art, especially modern art, especially abstract art, is that we are not used to using our eyes in a contemplative fashion. We are used to using our vision in a functional way. So what do we do when we see a stop sign? I know we have several artists tuning in, so you might be excluded from this, but for the most part, we don't sit in our cars and contemplate the Pantone color of the sign or the, um, the, sh the shape of it or the particular typeface or any aspects of, the, of its design or its wear and tear or the bolts that hold it together. The world around us, outside of the museum, conspires to make us functional lookers. 
and social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram are, de are designed on an even greater level to enable us to get that immediate satisfaction. So what do we do? We scroll through our feeds and stories and get quick information and move on to the next story. And there's so much visual information around us that we tend to shut all other things out. We focus on what we need, we get the information, and we move on. So what happens then when people go into a museum and see something like this? And for many of us, confusion sets in. We clench up. And the most common reaction is a defensive one. And how many of you have gone to a museum and looked at an abstract painting and thought one of the following things? And I'll let you read this to yourself and I would love for you to help me add to this internal monologue that you might have experienced when seeing a work of abstract art in a museum. And maybe you can help me add to this list. It's too flat, it's one dimensional, it's ambiguous. There's no beauty in, in it. It's too hard on the brain. The artist is just trying to make something out of nothing. And if we can't read it, it's easier to dismiss it. And why do we do this? There's this expectation to get the immediate answer to the painting. And I'm thinking about my toddler who when I ask a question uh, to him, he often responds back, tell me, tell me the answer. And that's just what we do. We want that, we want that answer immediately. So while people go through their everyday lives in a low context environment, works of modern art and especially abstract art are highly charged contextually. But there is no explanation at first and we are simply not used to this type of encounter. And so the next concept comes out of our expectations of what we want art to do for us. Abstract art is often that movement that can cause the most frustration when it comes to our traditional notions of what we think art intends to do or ought to do or how we think it should serve us. So when it comes to abstract art, it doesn't do the things we might want of it or expect of it, or rather it doesn't do it directly or immediately or the way we be become accustomed to. What if we let go of our expectations and embrace the present moment of looking? And this may require a certain degree of vulnerability. It takes vulnerability to be present. But through vulnerability, it also opens us, us up to new possibilities, new opportunities, and ideas. So we are going to get vulnerable, and I'll, uh, I'll practice that vulnerability with this particular exercise. So I cannot see you. I cannot hear you. This will be completely anonymous, but I would, what I would like to do is present to you a quick activity, and I'm going to show you a series of slides, six in total, with two works side by side. And with all but one of those slides, these are all works that are done roughly at the same time period, so between the 1950s and 70s. These are artists that are running parallel to each other. And some of the works are figurative and some of the works are more abstract. And I would like you to do is say out loud if you're drawn to the work on the right or the work on the left. Now remember, I can't hear you, I can't see you. So, but still go through the exercise of saying out loud, right, left. And if you're still confused, I have a TikTok that, or a video that will help you, might help you explain more. 
And remember that your reaction to the art is a personal one and it's conditioned by your own background, your own experiences, and they all play in a very important role for how you receive a work of art. So give yourself the freedom to react intuitively. All right, here we go. Six slides, six seconds each. Let's take a moment to reflect on that exercise. What did you notice? Did you find yourself favoring one of the works over another? Did you, did you find yourself when doing that exercise favoring more of the figurative over the abstract or vice versa? Were you surprised by which ones you were more drawn to? And can you parcel out some of the qualities that might peak, have piqued your interest the most? Okay, so moving on. Can art communicate feeling purely through material and form? So this next question centers around how does art communicate meaning? Just through material and form alone. And I would like us to spend some time thinking about how we can look at a work of art purely through its visual qualities. How can we read a work well has so much to do with our visual analysis of it. So when we look at a work, a painting like Oath of the Horatii, what we could do is situate it within the works of art that came before it or the political, social, and economic context in which this work was made. But instead, I want us to think about looking purely through a visual experience. So we're going to focus on what we see and its composition rather than how the work is organized or arranged. So look at this painting purely in terms of its visual elements, in terms of scale, shape, color. And the first thing we could notice when we look at this painting are these very clear details. And you have all of these diagonal lines converging at a central focal point. And what does this technique do for the painting? It helps to unify the composition. We have symmetry, we have proportion and simplicity. And this creates a sense of strength and unity. This work was painted right, around, right, about, right before the French Revolution where there is still a call for artists to depict virtuous behavior. It's painted in the 1700s, but depicts a story from Roman history, where Rome is at war with the city-state of Alba. The cities decide that instead of going into war, they're going to end the conflict by sending representatives from each city to fight it out. And whoever is left alive is claimed victorious. So to defend Rome, there are the Horatii brothers depicted here. And to defend Alba, there are the Horatii brothers. And here you have the three brothers preparing for battle. They salute their swords held up by their father and pledge to fight to the death. 
How does form convey a message of structure and control? And when you look at the men giving the oath to their father, their bodies are so rigid. And look at the contrast of the men compared to the women. Look at their form, which is so curvilinear. We can feel their personal anguish as their loved ones embark to battle. And this is a work we can wrap our heads around. Whether we know the context or not, it's didactic, it's easy to read. There's a sense of logic to it. And we often respond best to works of art that are a vessel of communication. And here I'm showing you the prevailing style of the Rococo with Fragonard's The Swing. And here the illusion conveys a narrative. So even though we're looking at a flat surface, we forget that it's paint on canvas. We just see the subject and the illusion of space. The paint becomes invisible and enables us to focus on the subject matter. The swing was commissioned by a Frenchman of the royal court who asked Fragonard to paint him and his mistress with a bishop uh, who's pushing his mistress on a swing and he hides in the bushes and looks up her dress. It's meant to be playful, to convey uh, a feeling of seduction. And I would argue here that with this type of imagery, it's easier to ascribe our own narrative to it. So some of you might look at this work and see it as uh, having a sense of playfulness or a sense of sensuality, but it might also bring up for others of you a tinge of indulgence. And a feminist reading might look more critically at this work and at the sexual power of women in the aftermath of the French Revolution. So going back to this idea of abstract arts difficulty, we might feel more comfortable ascribing our own narrative to a painting when the narrative is more recognizable, but when we have an abstract work, it might seem much more challenging. Okay, so art up to this point had been all about illusion. And the idea was to hide the brush strokes and the mark of the artist, and to render something. And as we move into the 19th century, artists begin to use the application of paint and material and form in a different way. And the advent of impressionism changed the way artists look at the, looked at the world in a completely different way. And here I'm showing you Manet's Music in the Tuileries in 1862. The gardens were right outside of the Louvre. They were converted and open to the public in the mid 1800s and an opportunity for the public to gather and listen to music. And what do we see here? We see lots of people gathered outside under a canopy of trees with just a glimmer of sky at the top of the canvas. Manet was one of the first artists to steer away from what was called the academic style and what was traditionally seen by the salons and moved towards a new style of painting, not only in subject matter, but also in technique. So we're not seeing a painting depicting the past. We are not seeing, we are seeing, however, a scene for modern industrious life. And he's painting it in an entirely new way. So unlike Oath of Horatii, which we just saw, that has one single point of view, there's no central focal point. There's a disintegration of depth perspective. And with no clear vanishing point, we are not even sure where the horizon line is. I'll just have you look more closely as we zoom in, we can start to appreciate these very loose and gestural styles that Manet is using. And we can also notice the blocky rendering of form in a way that each shape exists in its own space with almost an abrupt transition of color. So in traditional style of painting, you might have more smoother transitions. And here we have these very blocky transitions. And look at this umbrella, for example, with these darker outlines. And again, we see the beginning of this gestural looser technique and an almost abstracted style of painting. 
Moving from Manet to Monet, we see small and thin, but also discreetly visible brush strokes. It's very clear that Monet isn't interested in capturing the fine details. He wasn't aiming at perfection. Monet wanted to understand how light and color operate. The forms and the object appear only when the light, when the eye fuses the strokes at a certain distance. When it came to landscape, he'd want to focus on how the landscape is perceived by the eye, not necessarily how it might have looked in a photograph, but how the individual actually sees it. And what one of Monet's students once described his style while writing, when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, a tree, a house, a field, merely think here, here's a little square of blue, here's an oblong of pink, here's a streak of yellow, and paint it just as it looks to you. The exact color and shape until it gives you your own naive impression of the scene before you. So there is this idea here to paint what you see, not what you think you see. Monet worked on dozens of paintings of a single subject in differing light conditions. And when you look at a Monet painting, you see someone of resounding sensitivity to form and color and light. With the haystacks, the haystacks become secondary and the emphasis becomes less on subject and more about form. And this is an example of Monet's late works in the 1920s, part of a series of his water lilies, where he's pushing this exploration of color and loose brushstroke, where nothing is clearly defined. And these water lilies are unprecedented in terms of the conventions of landscape painting, lacking a horizon line or path for our eye to travel. The Impressionists bring us into an entirely new style of painting, where painting becomes a practice of contemplating the present moment. And Impressionists also help pave the way from restrictions to total freedom. So with Monet's late works, there's almost a foreshadowing here of the origins of large scale abstract painting. But I would also say that there's this beautiful blending between abstraction and forms that we can recognize. And we will see this with Andrew Forge's style later on in the talk. As we move to the rise of abstraction with Jackson Pollock, we can ask ourselves, what does abstract art allow the artist to do? And one of the things that Pollock was trying to do was capture an experience or experiences. It's not a painting that's telling you a story. It's a record of his experience. So you might be thinking here, like my toddler would, tell me, tell me, tell me its meaning. Uh, and what Pollock, and we can think here, what is Pollock withholding in terms of conventional representations of meaning? With Pollock, there's no scene to grasp onto. He doesn't lead you anywhere. There's no central focal point, no reference. The surface seems so devoid of content and yet it is bursting with energy and movement. What does abstract art allow the artist to do? Without illusion, we are challenged to observe the work based on how the paint is applied to the canvas and our own emotional and personal response to it. And to share with you, some of my students have ascribed their own meanings onto this work and talked about how the layer upon layer of paint reminds them of the way in which we are receiving or constantly being bombarded by information right now, or how this painting looks like an explosion, or how all of these gestural lines evokes a sense of the improvisation of jazz. So even without a subject matter, the work begins to carry meaning. And Pollock compels us to question, is it actually the subject matter that mucks up our experience? What if we let go and allow the marks of the artist to do the work? And what directions can this approach pull us in? 
As we segue into Andrew Forge, The Limits of Sight, Forge takes these past historical concepts and prevents another way of exploring the present moment. And I mentioned earlier that Forge was an inspirational educator and he often emphasized close looking. His students often commented on how they would look at a Rothko painting for several hours at a time. But with his painting specifically, there's this thickness of paint that is so palpable that it slows you down and it almost becomes an act of mindfulness and reflection onto itself. And Forge's works invite us to look, to receive, to get ourselves out of the way. You can't find the merits of Forge's work until you have entered into it, entered into its structure. So we're going to spend under two minutes looking at the exhibition. And instead of thinking about what the works you see do not have, consider what information is being presented. Let the content come from the surface, the mark making, the color palette. And as you look, I want you to think about the questions, what does this approach allow the artist to do? And what do these works ask of you? Or rather, what could they be communicating to you? show, Karen Wilkins talks about how titling the exhibition, The Limits of Sight, was a nod to how Forge tests our limits of what we see. We need to give in to the mood, to the tone, to the feeling that these works conjure up. And they require of us a certain degree of concentration. So how do we read a Forge? My call to you is to read it intuitively. Let's take a moment to look at Forge's painting, Tree of Life. And instead of saying, why, tell me, start by asking questions. What's my initial reaction? What comes to mind? Am I meeting this painting with a certain degree of skepticism or am I drawn to it? Does the composition, line, texture, shape puzzle me? Does it feel spontaneous or calculated? What emotion does this work convey? What sensation? And why am I thinking of that particular sensation right now? What have I just seen? What have I recently experienced? What's going on in my everyday life? 
that is making me feel this sensation in relationship to this painting. And as you look closer, you may start to see these faint dreamlike suggestions of things you recognize. Is it a tree? And as you get closer and go back and forth, and this is the one of the benefits of looking at this painting on your screen, things may reveal itself and appear and disappear as you look more closely and for longer periods of time. So in closing, I want to bring us back to this image of Agnes Martin at, with this notion of her painting with her back to the world and introduce my last question regarding abstract art's ability to provoke and respond to our contemporary climate. Does abstraction turn away from the world? Is it a retreat from reality? Or can we look at abstract art as being engaged with the world? And a very timely example is the recent events regarding Philip Guston. Guston was a contemporary of Jackson Pollock who is known for these seemingly clumsy brush strokes. He grew up in LA and there was a great deal of Ku Klux Klan activity in Southern California. He hated the Klan, he feared the Klan, but he incorporated it into his imagery, both figurative and abstract. And one of his most poignant Klan paintings is a work called The Studio. And it's a hooded figure doing a self-portrait of another, another hooded figure. And how do we read this? Who is this figure? One interpretation is that it's Guston himself and a vulnerable personal reflection of his own sense of culpability and a commentary on racial violence in America. This was painted in 1969. A few weeks ago, several museums including London's Tate Modern, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and the MFA in Boston announced that they were going to postpone a major Guston retrospective because they were worried that these painful images might be misinterpreted or might be misread. And the show was canceled, or I should say postponed, due to the, the potential that these paintings might bring up misrepresentations or misreadings. So what do you make of these museums decision to pull down this show? Well, for many, the decision was slammed. And in an open letter by almost a hundred art history figures, including a number of black artists, they called upon these museums to seriously reconsider and reverse their plans, expressing the importance to have these works up on view. And there was a sense of responsibility to meet the real urgencies of the present moment. Without the context about Guston, what would you have seen? And how would you have read these works? Are these clan hoods or lumpy haystacks or ghosts? Or are they just marks on canvas? Can abstract painting really be read to the point of provoking outrage? In closing, one of the things that I would like you to take away from this talk is that these paintings, whether a Monet or a Forge or Guston, essentially say the same thing. Regardless of whether you like or dislike the artwork, it is succeeded to some degree by getting you to look, to reflect on perception and the power of perception and form a dialogue around it. And to a large degree, all of these paintings yield only what you put into them. They will speak to us if you are open to the invitation to do so. And I will leave you with one final quote. The first demand of any work of art makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive. Get yourself out of the way. There's no good asking if whether the work before you deserves such a surrender. For until you have surrendered, 
you cannot possibly find out. And this is the last slide with the checklist that you're welcome to screenshot if you like. And instead of wrapping up this talk with, uh, with questions, I thought and I would love if we could open it up as more of a discussion or a chat with any thoughts that you had about any of the particular works or the concepts and what larger questions these talks raised for you. Thank you so much for listening in and Michelle, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Danielle, for that very stimulating and engaging talk. And we do have some questions and observations that have been coming in on the quicklive.com. Uh, two of them, there are two separate ones, but from I think the same person, Una, so I'm gonna put them together. Okay. Um, she said first that faced with a Pollock like that, I feel overwhelmed. How do I start to digest this? And then she added, is it normal that abstract art is presented without frames? Oh, that's an ex two excellent questions. Thank you, Una. The, that feeling of, I feel overwhelmed. That's a beautiful reading and interpretation of Pollock's work. I would say that Pollock felt overwhelmed. He's painting, he's painting this right around the time of the atomic bomb. It's this is this particular work is called Lavender Mist in the 1950s. The world is changing. There's new information, new technology. We're right at uh, two major world wars. And the time period is so overwhelming. It is so apropos to our pandemic, our feeling of confusion. And it's a very real reflection or sensation of this work that I feel that uh, Pollock had himself most likely, both personally and in terms of the cultural context. And then in turn, what was the second question, Michelle? Is it normal that um, abstract art is presented without frames? Okay, uh, there's, two, there's two components of that question. One, uh, modern art that off, it, it depends from one work to the next and one artist to the next. So if you're looking at a Miro or a Magritte, that those works are often could be framed. Mark, Mark Rothko, who was a, a later abstract painter, he tended not to frame his works. And I would say that contemporary artists who are working in abstraction often tend not to frame their work, but it's, it's always subjective. And Susan shared that she said, I used to say those things. Why is this in a museum? A child could do this, et cetera. Until I read Kandinsky, it changed the view I had about abstract painting. So do you recommend people going to the source to get a sense of what the artists themselves might have to say? Would that help us approach the art in a different way? Yes, I love that, Susan. So Susan's uh, making a reference to, um, hopefully I'm saying this right, Kandinsky's the on spirituality and art, but Kandinsky looked quite a bit on the relationship between art and spirituality and art and music and art and synesthesia and all of these connections. And it's a, it's a really beautiful way that we can tap into the work. And it, it's also pointing to this very particular moment that makes modern art modern art that where David or Fragonard, we don't have, we know David's political standpoint at the time that he was making Oath of the Horatii, but for the most part, he doesn't, we don't have these artists talking about why they're painting. As we move into abstraction and with modern artists, we, and especially during the post-war period, we begin to see a series of isms, surrealism, futurism, abstraction, where artists are starting to comment more about the act of painting, their own personal response to it, and also their, um, what they're referencing both past and in terms of the contem contemporary climate. So Gregory is taking us to a little bit of that broad view, and he points out that um, in his perspective, Indian art, although it is representational, he says, I find it very frustrating because I simply do not know much of anything about it. So the problem is not unique to abstract art. So do you have guidance for people who are overwhelmed by looking at other forms of art they're unfamiliar with? I love that. 
And I will go back to one of my favorite slides on vulnerability. It's okay not to know how to read a work at first. And I will bring us back to that C.S. Lewis quote that we can't possibly enter a work until we surrender to it. And what I would ask of you is to shift your perception, uh, especially with uh, Indian art as you made a reference to or, or any work of art that you go into a museum that you might not know how to encounter at first or you might, know the, you might not know the context, start by asking questions. So instead of saying to yourself, why did the artist do this? Or why are they using these materials? Think to yourself, what do I see? What choices is the artist making? And remember here that no artist, artists are working intentionally and their strategies are strategic. So even though they are leaving things out, that is often a very conscious choice. The most important thing to remember about abstract artists in particular is that for many of them, they all come from an academic style of painting. They know how to draw, they know technique, and it takes courage to uh, break away from that and to experiment with new, new styles and go towards complete freedom. So what? look at what you do see. And again, go back to that idea of, a visual analysis. What can you pull from the meaning based on what the artist is including? So look at the materials, the form, and what you do see. And if, you, and if you're looking at what you're seeing directly in the work and then looking at how, thinking about how you're responding to it, that will hopefully help you uh, come to a deeper reading of it. So this uh, might dovetail very nicely with what Linda uh, contributed. She said she doesn't have a question, but a profound quote from Joseph Albers, art is not an object, it is an experience. I love. <laughs> <laughs> and also we have Suzanne who comments, uh, the emotional response is immediate, but I like the intellectual response more. Mm -hmm. I believe that the experience of art is threefold, the artist, the artwork, and the viewer. I am more drawn to abstract art because it requires the viewer to be present to have a response. I love that. I love that trifecta. And uh, this, this is especially true of modern art and contemporary art is like it or not, it asks more of you. It requires us to question the act of making art, the mark making of the artist, the experience of the artist during the act of making it and also our own reaction to it. So it requires more work, but it, it can really lead as we've talked about uh, to new possibilities and meaning and a deeper encounter, a more meaningful experience with the work of art. And I, I, I love the combination of those three. That's really, really a wonderful insight. Thank you. Uh, Karen shares with us that what this has meant to me is that I need to shed my concern about what others expect me to think about a piece of art and let myself go and experience and interpret it the way that it's most meaningful to me. That freedom allows me to experience the work from my own perspective. Yes, that's great. Uh, and the, the museum educator in me is thinks so much about how modern art and, and museums can tend to feel so exclusive and so elitist. And the most important thing that we can do is just have a little bit of, of humor when looking at a work of art and, and by taking it a little bit less seriously and embracing it for what it is, it'll perhaps help us with a, um, a more, a, a more lighthearted reaction reaction to it. And since you mentioned galleries being a little elitist, I think one of the points made in that letter, the Philip Gustin letter that you brought up was that, you know, museums should trust their viewers, their visitors a little bit more. And Mary Alice asks, uh, she says, thanks for bringing in the postponing of the Gustin exhibit. And she wonders if you know where that stands right now after the letter. Oh, that's really interesting. I don't know where that stands, but I have no doubt that 
these museums are, are responding to this call. It it's also brings up, perhaps this is a, a talk for another time, Michelle, um, but it also brings up a completely different topic around how museums are in this new era of no longer working in isolation or just putting works up subjectively they're really being required now more than ever to respond to public need and the public is being more aggressive than ever to to make sure that museums are meeting the demands of its constituencies so i i will have to look into that more i don't know the answer but i have no doubt that these museums are are hopefully being challenged by the challenge the challenge that's being called upon them and so we have two questions which are a little bit related um, about sort of how museums provide the sort of mediation between the art and the viewer. Uh, so Pam asks, is your feeling that we should experience the art first and then read about how it was created? Sometimes understanding how an exhibit came to be gives the pictures more meaning. And Fred asks, would you encourage museums not to place descriptive labels? Oh, that's such a good question. Again, maybe a topic for a whole different talk, but all of these questions come around the idea of didactics, which means the interpretive materials around the works of art. And, and I can't help but mentioning that the most commonly read didactic or interpretive material in a museum for all demographics is the children's guide. So adult viewers tend to look at the kids activity guide over the label or over the introductory wall text of a museum. And I think that that's so interesting in terms of what a viewer might, uh, might be looking for when they go into a museum. I have to admit that I am a contextualist. I am hungry and starved for uh, more content and more meaning. I tend to go look at the label first. Um, and this is, so I am practicing what I preach in this talk where I, it's so easy for me to go to the context. So I, I have to actively practice looking at the work of art directly, taking it in and then layering it with meaning. And the best practices that I've seen in museums when museum educators are facilitating conversations is having the viewer look closely, discuss collaboratively with the group what they see, and then build information. I'm also not advocating entirely to just let the work be as it is. I feel that context is really important and can really add some beautiful layers. So I would never want to exclude it. And I do feel, especially um, where there are so many more voices that museums have a responsibility to incorporate into museum texts and objects, that I would say that now more than ever, there are great opportunities for museums and they should be called upon more to incorporate context when necessary or when it might shed some more light on, uh, on the work for the audience. Well, taking, taking it back a little bit to Andrew Forge, uh, Hannah just wanted to share that Andrew Forge is a wonderful colorist. His colors are magnificent and gorgeous, so rich. And I wanted to link that to a question um, shared by Mariano, who says, is it possible to establish a difference between abstract painters with and without a goal when painting? This would mean that we can't find anything in the latter's paintings. And I wonder where you think Andrew Forge might fall in that um, division that Mariano just suggested. Wow, um, I wish that we were could open this up for a discussion because I can channel some of the artists that I work with and and um, wish they could speak up to this particular question. The first one on Forge around um, the color, I should mention that it's almost impossible to to tell you what particular color he's using because there are thousands of marks on the canvas uh, and they really took they were very, very time consuming and full of color. And I, in terms of this idea of a goal, Forge is a, a particularly relevant for that question because he's so rooted in 
and in the academic world. There is a, a recent publication that came out on Forge's it's called observation notation, where he write he he wrote about Monet and Duchamp and Rauschenberg, and he has all of these artists in mind, and yet he's doing something entirely new. So I feel as if even though art, artists, especially abstract artists, especially abstract artists today, that are looking towards this goal of total freedom they still have as a reference point, even subconsciously, artists and their everyday life and their everyday experiences. And yet, I think they're, they try to push that away as they work towards complete freedom. And, and I should mention that it, it takes courage to do that. It takes courage to do something completely new. I, I, ha I, I feel as if Forge sits somewhere in the middle of that, where there, there are a lot of references. I see a lot of Monet and the Impressionists in his painting, but he's also uh, working towards the idea of letting intuition guide him. So I, I would say that the goal, even if the goal itself is total freedom of expression, there's still a goal there. So we're just about at the end of our time, but we've had a couple of requests in the chat for you to just go back over the questions that people can ask themselves when confronting an abstract work of art for the first time. So maybe you could just walk us through those one more time before we call it an evening. Sure, I would love to. So first and foremost, what is perception? And that relates a lot to this idea of allowing yourself the freedom to just remember that we don't go through our everyday lives in this highly charged contextual environment. Remember that we are glued to our phones. There's a lot going on. And so we remember that perception, visual perception is a process. It's a practice. How can art communicate feeling purely through material and form? This, or can art communicate feeling purely through material and form? This goes back to this idea that just because there's not a narrative or an illusion that is easily recognizable, can we just look at the surface of the painting and what meaning is rendered just through that? What does abstract art allow the artist to do? This is a really challenging question and it, it is always open-ended for, for every work of art. But I would urge you to think about if an artist is excluding something, what are they strategically including? And then is abstraction relevant? And I would say that that has two components. Is it relevant to us and our inner reality? And how is it relevant to larger political and social questions? Great, well, thank you so much, Danielle. You've given us so much to think about. And thank you everyone who tuned in. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much, Michelle.